Brilliant. Okay, well, we'll just uh, come into the room now, Annie. So uh, she'll be there any second. We're just going to wait for people to come in, but oh, it's just so good to see you. Right. So we, um, we, we've known each other quite a while, and uh, um, we, we have a lot of chats together, and they're, they're usually off camera. Uh, so uh, it's been really great to kind of have you come and join us in the group today, and, uh, uh, and to kind of so we can share our, our conversation with, um, with people in the group. Um, so, Annie. Uh, I was just trying to think back to how we first connected, and it was it was because of I, I, I'd read Midnight Dog Walkers, like a lot of people, uh, and I loved that book when it when it came out. And it was different because it wasn't it wasn't just a how to manual. Uh, it was it was very much about looking at um, kind of connecting to the to the caregiver and, and, and telling a story really uh, with advice through it. And I think that's where we first kind of got together, I think, because I think I contacted you um, then. Uh, and then it turned out that you'd seen the, um, the Beyond the Opera conversation. So we ended up having this kind of joint coming together, didn't we? And also it's um, really great to be in, in your, I love your group and um, to be here today in July, because it was one year ago that the acquisitions editor of the publisher who bought the Midnight Dog Walkers called me out of the blue and asked me to write a so-called second edition, which it's, it's not, it's a new book, um, a year ago today. And then I literally spent the last year writing it. So it's, um, it's, it, it's interesting to be talking about now. I, I've only had like two weeks, the past two weeks where I wasn't working on the book. And it, it takes that much, you know, it takes that much energy and, so I'm kind of I kind of don't know what to do with myself because I have a lot more time all of, all of a sudden. But I'm not writing another book. I didn't even I wasn't even going to write this one. It was it was close. It was so close. But I'm so glad I did. And and you have a big part of, of that because I finally went back and forth. I, I went they went out very dramatically to my husband and I had printed out the contract, which you don't need because you can sign electronically electronically. But I had it in my hand. I'm like, I'm gonna sign, rip this up. I'm not signing it. He's like, don't, it's fine. You shouldn't do it because he has to live with the writer because I knew how much <laughs> it was going to be. And um, I wasn't even actually that enthusiastic. It was supposed to be a, a how-to because this publisher does how-to, like step by step by step. And I couldn't imagine that with dogs because every dog is different. Every owner is different. They're all of it. But I thought about it and Denise Amore helped, helped me over the hump and encouraged me. And I did write it. And um the, the part that, well, you had a, you, you and Denise both have a huge influence on this book because I signed it in July. I started writing in August. I had six months and it ended up being, I think, 300 pages. And I met all the de deadlines. But in August, I, I began asking myself, what's new in helping reactive and troubled dogs? And why are there so many more than there were? Because in that dog walker was 2016, uh, I think. So I wanted to know, has, please let there be anything new. Is it all counter conditioning and desensitizing or ha have, has the industry learned from recent science of the last 20 years and been, come up with something new, a new way to help dogs that I think would be faster than that. And a lot of owners have trouble, I, in my experience with counter conditioning. So I asked what's new. I stumbled across Beyond the Operant, your chats. And I'm like, what, Beyond the Operant, what are these people talking about? And I stopped writing, even though I had that deadline and I watched every single one of them and saw people like Laura, Dr. Laura Donaldson, Kathy Murphy, Kim Brophy, the, the it girl right now in the industry. And it just blew my mind. And it got me excited for dogs and their owners. And I like, here, here are people coming up with, it's, I mean, some of it's not even new. It's just pulling in different, the whole dog, you know, like Kim's legs program and also allowing owners and trainers to talk about dogs the way normal people do, which is a lot of love. We love dogs. You don't get them because you don't love them. And I feel like the training world has been very strict. We're not talking love for some reason, which is strange to me because it's the bond. That's why I think you and I have bonded so much because we were always out there talking about the bond and how important it is. So that's, that's how we arrived here. Yeah, and I think your kind of your kind of journey through through this has very much mirrored the the changes that have been going on in, in the kind of community as a whole, really. And uh, we'll we'll come back to the new book in, in a mo. But if we go back to kind of Midnight Dog Walkers, because even then um, there was a heavy em em emphasis on the bond there, and also on the the emotional experience for the caregiver as well. I, I think uh, that's why I love the book so much because it, it very much 
looked at the whole situation you know uh, tell us a little bit about what your how you came to write that book what, what was the motivation there and um uh that got you to think about why it was important to write that book I was writing for the time for Dogster, both their magazine and their online. I was a training expert. And um, so I had been used to doing that and they had a publishing wing. And I can't remember if they asked me or I asked them, I, I can't remember actually how it came about, um, but I was working with the editor very closely there. So we knew each other and she liked my writing style, but it, it came about when I had the opportunity, I had the platform, which was a gift from Dogster. Um, but two, I had been in rescue with Austin Dog Rescue back in wilder and crazier than hell, Texas, from like late 1990s to 2010, when we moved to Colorado and I was completely exhausted from fostering because my husband and I cared for over 400 dogs in that span, a lot of puppies in there too. Right. And this, I was, I kind of felt like it was a crisis for dogs back then because of all of my work in the shelters. They were so bad and they're still bad. They're, they're slightly improved in some places, but I was out in the country. So I was going to little small rural shelters that were just, they weren't even trying to get them out. They were just putting them down basically for space, not because of behavior issues. So I kept thinking, how can I reach? And I feel for owners. I mean, we were owners before we were trainers and we didn't, that's why so many of us are crossover trainers because it wasn't there. Clicker training was sort of new when we, when we started out. And that's just how you did things, you yank, it, yank and crank the dog. So I feel I've always kind of focused on the owner because they don't know the, what we all know about the industry. It's an ugly awakening when they do find out that the industry has a dark tone, undertone to it. And they don't know that there's a choice generally between a force-free trainer like us or people who are willing to, in my opinion, harm a dog and call it training with tools or threats or kicks or whatever they're doing. So from my perspective, it's always kind of felt like it's urgent <laughs> that I need to reach these owners. And that kind of drives me to do to write this stuff. And I've always been a journalist as well um, because what I was seeing in the shelters and I thought it's, just, uh, it's my response. It's not really, I accepted the responsibility but I didn't breed any of these dogs but I'm the one that has to go in to these shelters and look at these puppies in their faces and know that, that the ones I don't take that day are not gonna make it more, more than mm -hmm. likely. Very, back then, this is 10, 15 years ago. So that was a heavy burden on me. And I thought, or dogs would be returned for things like he got too big and it's a German shepherd or he bit the kid and it's a boarding co border collie or he jumps on people or he doesn't walk nicely on leash. It wasn't the reactivity that we're seeing now, the explosion of that, which I think we're actually breeding for these days. We're making dogs crazy by the way we breed them. So, and care for them and our expectations of them, but um, we can talk about that later if you want. But um, so anyway, that was my driving point. I felt like so many awesome dogs that will never bite anybody in their lifetime, no matter what is heaped upon them, need homes. They need loving homes. And we were just drowning in dogs. And now they're drowning, shelters are drowning again because of COVID. Like I've never seen it this bad. Like every shelter I follow, they're begging. And so if, you, if you're listening and if you can foster or adopt, or donate or volunteer, this is the time to do it because they're, they're in dark straits. So that's what drove me is, I wanna help the owner figure some of this out, which who to hire and why, and train your dog with kindness. You know, you don't have to harm me. It's, and I don't do well in, with patriarchy. My husband says I've managed to live above it. And I'm definitely one of the mouth, mouthy women that would have been burned at the stake for sure, because I, don't, I do what I want and I follow my own rules and I don't let anybody else tell me what to do. But I've certainly felt the oppression that all women and, and minorities have from the patriarchy. And I think the patriarchy very much hurts men as well. I think we're where we are right now in the world because men haven't been allowed to be full human beings and it's other men doing that. I think there's a lot in that because when we think about, um, uh, you know, men, and I am one, so I can, I can say this, uh, we, we made this kind of assumption that part of the patriarchy is something to do with, with the power being with, especially with white men. Uh, but actually, it's with wealthy white men. It's the ones there that are, that are creating the kind of the political agendas, uh, all these kind of things. I think your working class man has all these kind of uh, unrealistic expectations put on them by that kind of outlook, I think, without any really good, appropriate emotional outlets. So it's difficult, and this is probably why we got more men in jail and more men committing suicide. There's all sorts of reasons there, but but no, you're right. And I think you know, when we look at 
uh, how we've looked at dog training initially, it, it fitted this notion of this kind of need for control, uh, this need for some kind of the, the, the individual setting those rules of behavior that are expected of another uh, and making sure that those are complied to. Uh, uh, and that's what we kind of inherited through, through dog training. It was just, a, it was just a, a mirroring really from a more general societal outlook, wasn't it? And it's, it's absolutely absurd now, in my, and it always was absurd, the idea of dominance theory that people bought into that, like that clicked in a whole lot of trainers' minds who wanted to dominate a dog. I, I feel like there's two different, there's two types of trainers in the world. Those of us who lean more on the empathic side of things and can understand that a dog is suffering in this world. And then the other are the hardliners. And I even have said sociopathic. Some, some are truly sociopathic and they, they like the domination. They, they still believe in dominance theory, which has been completely debunked by the original scientists who studied wolves. And to think a little animal is trying to dominate us. I mean, that, I think that's sick thinking. I honestly do. So then you get into alpha rolling and the dog has to mind you. And so we micromanage every moment of every dog's life and they ha have no freedom, they have no agency. I mean, I think it's really kind of an emergency situation still for dogs. They're, they've been shunted to the lowest, um, particularly in rural areas in the United States, but all everywhere. Like white men, rich white men here, then not so rich white men, and then maybe minority men, then you get to the women. <laughs> And then below, and then children, in terms of how we care for these people and, and their importance in society. And then the, the animals are at the very end, including wild animals. They're just last on the list, I feel like. Even though, I can't remember how many millions of dogs are in the States, people, those of us who love dogs love them deeply and are very bonded to them. And when they're suffering, I feel like we're suffering. And um, I see a whole lot of suffering in the dog world. Even for those of us who, um, pamper the dog, spoil the dog. They have the best bed and the best food and they go to the vet. They're still our captives. They live with our four walls. And um, I like what Shay Kelly uh, talks about canine enrichment, his whole Facebook group, and he's got a book on it. And we, we know that zoo animals, they're trapped animals. I think we just separated them because they're wild. They're different from dogs. Dogs aren't wild. When 80% of the world's dogs don't live with people, they live in on the street or in villages or where they're not bothered by us. Um, so it, it just kind of, my whole thinking about dogs has shifted. And it, I think what happened during COVID a lot is people were very concerned and upset. We didn't know what was happening. We, we might've all been dead by now and a lot of people are dead. And it was, it was a new threat. You know, We're used to war and all the other daily threats, but this one had the ability to come right into our homes and make people we love very sick. I mean, it's stressful, stressful, stressful international times. So people got dogs, I think, for self-comfort, a lot of reasons. Now those dogs are being dumped in shelters because the employer said you had to come back to the office. And that is so distressing for a dog to have a home for two years and then le lose it, you know, and maybe not get out of the shelter. Not all of them will get out. So I think we have to think about what is the dog doing for us? Why do we have dogs? What do we owe a dog? Instead, and these, dogs really, and these are really fundamental questions, aren't they? I think mean, everything you just said there, you know, we, we um, uh, we're trying to fit these uh, wonderful animals, but not just dogs, actually. It's, it's, it, it's many parts of society into these kind of artificial uh, constraints, uh, all these kind of um, uh, situations, because, uh, you know, on my workshop that you came to on your birthday, which is great uh, to, to see on, on your birthday, uh, we looked at the whole thing about the good debate to continue and how we're all kind of indoctrinated into that and how much that is led, those people who decide what is good, what is bad is very much led through kind of a lot of political agendas in society. And that kind of notion of children should be seen and not heard, women should be seen and not heard, and, and we've kind of ended up with dogs should be seen and not heard. And, and there's, the problem with a lot of the ways that people, especially in the last 20 or 30 years, I think, Annie, with this big explosion on the marketing, quite heavy marketing of dog training as the solution to everything, regardless of method or tool. It's detached people from that bond that they probably had before actually, and that they probably seek now, but they're, they're less able to see it unless they're supported by somebody to, to see, actually your dog isn't trying to dominate you or your dog isn't being naughty. Your dog's just trying to express need. 
or your dog's just trying to express whatever it is that they, that they need to do. Uh, and I know when you did, um, when you were writing for Dogster, there was that piece that you wrote, which was just a piece about empathy, really, and compassion. And that gave us gave you a little taste of how, uh, how kind of warped the view of dogs and behavior was, even back then. That was even before the Midnight Dog Walks came out. Yeah, I um, definitely, they came from me in the comments and it, it toughened me up and it made me to where I do not care what horse trainers, I just don't. I'm not interested in what they're selling. Um, because if they, if they're willing to harm an animal, then I feel like I'm, they're not my friend. If they can't see what, and, and some can't, some actually can't, but they don't think that they're harming dogs. And that's why they're crossover trainers when they do finally see what they're doing. But that's on the dog trainer. They need to learn canine behavior and communication better and, and to see physically, visibly see when a dog is upset. And I think they just skip that part and skip the bond. Um, and they came after me, the, the trolls on Dogster, because it wasn't, uh, moderated at all. You, they just threw the riders to the wind and we were contract. We weren't even employed by them. And I asked them to, because about that time, um, the trolls were, they've always been out of control. Social media is a big part of the reason people are so rude and psychotic today, because they can be, they can be keyboard warriors. And a lot of news organizations either shut down their comments or they had a person moderating all the time because it gets nasty and pub, very, very personal attacks. And if they can find anything on you in your life, that you have done wrong, they will they will put it out there, or what they feel you have done wrong, like be not a white man, man for example, that you're just wrong just existing. But I'm I'm glad that happened because I I just really don't care anymore what they have to say, and they're not going to stop me. And I think that's what they want. They want us to sh sit down and shut up and mind our place. And I I'm just not that kind of person. So um, I did write. A, I think you're talking about the one that I called. I'm a soft trainer because there was so much, it was the TV guy with the nice teeth, has no formal training and dog training. He was huge at the time. If I wrote about him or if I, which had to be lawyered and vetted because he sues a lot of people. And I am a journalist, so I know how to not write something that's libelous. Um, or if I said something about being kind, they were like sharks. And it did at first take me back, back. like I'm not saying I guess I was attacking their view of how an animal should be treated. But when their view involves pain, I'm like, why are we having this discussion? But I think it's a lot like parents who say, I was spanked as a kid, and so I'm spanking my kids. And the kid, you know, the rest of us who were spanked were like, we didn't like it. It was, it did not help me love my parent more for being spanked. Um, it's, it's very curious. And I think it's, a, I think it is what we're doing and saying about dogs that we're somehow controversial because we're saying be kind to them you're allowed to love them you're allowed to say you love them that's controversial i mean i don't why it's it should be the other way the people that say harm your dog should be the ones that everybody's coming after and and that's changing i do think it's changing slowly yeah i think definitely even just um i don't know what it's like over there but here in the uk especially in my local area just even seeing the number of dogs on harnesses now compared to a few years ago I, I think people are more aware gradually becoming more aware the problem is of course that the dominance model is still so um you know a lot of people it's, it's still still in the zeitgeist isn't it for a lot of for a lot of people and i think it just creates a block for them you know we, we've discussed before that notion of being stuck in task you know the task of doing something training wise and uh, and i think it's it's crazy when we think that the general public have been convinced that the the most important thing is to have a well-trained dog. Now, it's not that it's not important, but to be the most important thing, uh, the general public end up with the situation where they can teach the dog or they can you know, train the dog to sit or down or whatever, but they don't know what pain or stress looks like. And everything the dog tries to do to communicate to them, actually, I'm struggling with this right now, they just see as a training issue or an obedience issue or whatever. And I think we just need to continue talking more about that individual dog's emotional experience because I think a lot of caregivers they're ready for that message they want to connect they do they want to seek a bond that actually is equitable and and after I wrote the second book this last year I it profoundly changed me as a person and it profoundly changed how I approach dogs and owners because I was pretty much retired before <laughs> I was had some online consulting for people if they really found me I wasn't advertising or anything um, 
but it, it profoundly changed me and shaped me for the good talking and it was talking to the there's 21 experts in there and, and you're one of them um because i feel i i've realized now that i i sought out people i have certain parameters like you know i want some new voices for example and it has to be reaching a lot of dogs and have some years of success behind whatever it is they're talking about. And I realized that everyone I chose, because I interacted with them a lot, they're very kind people. Like I, I was just drawn to their kindness online because that's how I knew some of them I didn't know at all and they didn't know me. They all agreed. And I also talking about um, training, an actual training of a dog, when I, I worked a whole lot with reactivity in, in the beginning years, and that's why I wrote the Midnight Dog Walkers, which is mostly focused on reactivity, uh, because owners feel, uh, uh, many owners feel a sense of shame and embarrassment that they cannot control their dog when it's going down the street and screaming at other dogs. So they call us in and we could fix it or reduce it if we could, if the dog was capable of it. And that's what we focused on the dog. We got to fix this dog who's screaming that he is uncomfortable. And now I've switched it to why. It was Sarah Fisher always says, why, 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 why? And I like to ask why. Why is that dog screaming? Why is he uncomfortable? He's expressing that he's terrified. And we just want to shut it down. We want it to walk nicely so the human is embarrassed. I mean, I feel like that was our, you know, that's how we operated. It's the dog's fault. <laughs> and it's kind of like women when they finally, or minorities, when they finally had enough and they start demanding their rights. And then it's like, you're crazy. You're rioting in the street. What's wrong with you? Be civilized. Oh. So, so you, it's like, but you either shut down a dog and uh, reduce all behavior and it's a miserable life, or you bring out the behavior and you solve the problem for the dog, you know, in a fair way. It's, it has to be fair to the animal. Um, and you and I are not saying, and others who say what we say, we're not saying don't ever train your dog. I think people hear it that way because maybe they want to hear it that way. Um, I use counter conditioning and desensitizing. It's just not the only part. It's not the only tool. And for many years, I felt like that was the holy grail. And then you get all these arguments about quadrants, the four quadrants and trainers attacking each other. And if you just put it over here, I know how to do it. I've done it successfully for thousands of dogs. But I mean, how many it wasn't successful for? Because it is a little bit complex, complicated and it takes time and it doesn't always work. So now we have all of these other tools in the toolbox that really has involved the stuff that's been there the whole time. It's not new science. And it's, it just was out of the picture. Like you can't talk about that. We don't talk about that. We only work on observable behavior that we can see. That left out everything, genes, learning, environment, history, trauma. You, you've talked about trauma, you know, dogs are traumatized. Particularly like I got mine at five, they were taken from their owner or their mother at five weeks. Why? Why did they do that? Mm. And I, I meant to get one cattle collie dog, but I'm a crazy person. So I got two because they were the last two left. And it, that first year of their lives, it was right before COVID hit. My husband and I looked like we had five children in the house. I mean, we were just completely exhausted because they were going at each other because they, they were taken too young. My theory is they were taken too young and the mother didn't separate it or the other, the other siblings weren't there. And they were left to their own devices. And so they would play really hard and they didn't, they didn't know how to back off. Like one would squeal and they, they would make almost like a prey drive, make the other one come in. So we spent the first year of their lives. I focused, and I, these dogs changed me as well because I wasn't concerned about training with them. I had put tons of titles on my very serious border collie siblings who loved obedience before that. I wanted them to be resilient and happy and like people if, their genetic code said that you like people, which it does, and like other dogs, but you don't have to play with them if you don't want to. And I want to recall because that's life-saving. I don't care about sit, down, stay. This is just me personally. It doesn't mean I don't, that's not I tell people to do with their dogs because I still am constantly guiding the dog. You know, they don't jump on me. They don't bite me. They don't bite people. I'm just like a, a guide or a mom or whatever you want to call it, a parent. Um, and these are the happiest dogs I've ever shared my life with. I mean, part of it is they're cattle dogs. And I think cattle dogs can be a bit of a jokester <laughs> kind of personality, um, but they have the very serious working because they're both, they came from working parents. One was a border collie, one was a healer, but they crack us up and they're very good friends now. They never fight. And I was prepared to re rehome one if I had to, if I couldn't convince them not to do that. 
they, ne they sleep next to each other. They eat next to each other. They're best friends, but it was a, so much work. But my, my focus on, I want you to be happy and resilient from this very harsh upbringing. It's traumatic to be taken at your mother from your mother at five it needs to be at least eight, preferably 10 weeks. And they missed out all on that mother stuff. So I worked around, worked around it and I started hosting um, free puppy play dates in my front yard before COVID hit at the right at the right time when their brains needed it and the puppy had to be under five months and it could not show any aggression and I checked them out before and no bad experiences just those you know those happy-go-lucky puppies that are still interested in other dogs and we did, met twice a week all kinds of different dogs all different types of play styles and energies and we would interrupt them if they got too um, crazy and too excited but that's where my dogs learned to back off they didn't have the ability really to teach each other because they just you know, like instinct took over and they would just wrestle until somebody, till we interrupted them basically. And so those other dogs did for, helped my dogs in a way that I couldn't do. And now they love dogs. And one is unneutered still, and nobody would know he's unneutered. He's a very gentle, sweet, kind of immature dog. They're both kind of immature. They're silly. Like I've allowed them space to be silly dogs. And um, they, I mean, they do stuff that I, it cracks me up. It might drive other people crazy, like if you open a Coke bottle with a fizz, they're gonna come save your life. If you hug your husband, they don't care for that. We fix that. They now permit us to do that in their presence. Do not dance. They don't, don't do that. Don't shovel snow um, because they, I, they have the protection instinct. And I, I think they think this, the snow shovel is killing us. So they uh, lose their minds. So we put them up, you know, we don't, I don't, I'm not trying to fix that in them. Yeah. I think this is a big uh, part of the, the shift or the, the way of thinking about things now is, is how we support that young dog through that first 12, 18 months. And again, for the general public, it's okay us kind of having these discussions, which is great. I always keep thinking about the kind of end user, the general public, and, and how we have in some part failed them a little bit because we've been very good at letting them know how we get you to tell your dog what to do. We haven't been equipping them enough to, to let them know what that feedback looks like uh, and also what that individual dog's care and support needs might be. And uh, a lot of people who are doing the early training differently now are very much focusing on really equipping that caregiver to be the best caregiver they can be um, and, and helping them navigate through. Because, you know, we, a lot of people have heard my story with Molly. We, we did something very similar with Molly. We did very little of the kind of functional, what you might class obedient stuff really, and just created lots of safe spaces for her to do that experimental learning. And, and then we learned what those care and support needs were from, from her. But there's this kind of um, narrative that, well, hang on, if you're not doing the training, somehow you're gonna end up with this kind of wild feral animal. But in fact, Molly has learned loads. She's learning all the time. Just because we might not be teaching her something specific doesn't mean she's not learning something from every interaction and everything. And it is building up that thing you were talking about, trying to get that dog to be as resilient uh, and as well regulated as possible, especially as they come through, uh, come through adolescence. So, so it's interesting that you've done that with, and I think a lot of actual of, of my colleagues that I've spoken to, even over the years, who might do a lot of training because they love the geeky stuff, actually at home they don't do much because they know how to connect and they take it for granted the fact that we know how to read dogs and, and do all that kind of stuff we need to be passing that information on to the general public more up front and i i learned recently um because covid we didn't have a lot of people over obviously for two whole years um so the dogs were just with us we, we met people walking you know those of us who still walked out in the world during the blade times um, and I think we did some play dates as well outside because we felt all felt pretty safe outside, but not very often because the whole world really was melting down. So I think we all got very insular uh, out of self-protection. Um, I recently had a very talented photographer who a client introduced me to here locally. She's a professional photographer and the publisher wanted more photos and it just happened to work out that we could get together. And she takes, she, she elevated the book because I was sending iPhone photos. <laughs> and so she came up, she said, I want to come into your house and shoot you with your dogs. And I was a little hesitant. I'm like, they're going to jump on you. Okay. I just need to tell you that. And, you know, I usually separate them behind a, a barrier and they settle down and then they can meet people. They know sit, they know how to sit, but I, we haven't had a lot of practice meeting people in the house because we haven't had a lot of people in the house for them to meet. And she's like, she's a great dog person. She said, it's fine. They'll be fine. <laughs> Old me would have been, but I don't have a demo dog. I'm a trainer. She probably expects a five minute downstay and 
you know, the dog to me be a, the little marionette and do what I say because I'm the boss. And we use Finn, the, I call him a white one because he's more white, but he's a red healer and he, he's lighter. So he's easier for, in photographs to see. He did, he was a saint. He did everything. Like we taught him like 10 things in an hour, like chin rest, bucket game, lie on a mat, stuff he had never done because I didn't have any reason for him to do that. And he was perfect. I have done some training with him with treats. So he understood what was happening. Um, but I think even if I hadn't done much with him in terms of formal training, it's the bond that he and I have that he's like, well, what are we doing next? What are we doing? Okay, I'll try that. Like he wasn't, he was a very willing participant. And so it really made me think about puppies um, and why there's so much trouble, tr trouble in adolescence. I mean, that's when we're generally called with when the behavior problem shows up. Is it because it's an adolescent mind? Yes, we know like teenagers, their mind is changing and they're maturing and all and hormones are rushing and all that. But is it because they've been micromanaged for a year or a year and a half and they have no freedom? And I feel, kind of feel like dogs, and I might write an article about this, dogs are, are going on strike. Like genetically, they've, they've had it as a group and they can't cope. And so now we're in more need than ever. Every expert I interviewed, I asked, are you seeing more reactivity and why? They're slammed, we're all slammed. So much so that some don't even teach puppy classes anymore, which is so needed. Or puppy enrichment, I would say. I would prefer that. Mm. Like, it, even puppy classes over the last few years when I was changing, I changed it more to social hour. You know, let's the, let these dogs, like we hold them back in the class. That's what we used to do on, on leash and expect an, basically a toddler brain to control itself and don't scream and whine at the other dog. You have impulse control. <laughs> and that I think builds more frustration. So I changed my puppy dates to, we'll get to sit and down later. Right now we're introducing them to things. And I think a lot of trainers are, has shifted, thankfully into that. Let's let the dog, let's expand the dog's thinking capability while, while we still have this four month window. And yeah, I mean, it's just interesting to see how frustrated dogs are. I really feel like kind of a spokesman or spokeswoman for them because they're, they aren't coping well. I, I was actually really worried about getting a puppy. Um, from a breeder or not a breeder. I checked out all different options and I looked at rescues and that's how I ended up a puppy actually because the rescues, I'm, I was always wanted herding, dog, herding dogs. So we'd go to herding dog rescues. The ones here were very honest with us, which I so appreciate. This dog bit a kid, this dog has reactivity, this dog doesn't know how to pee outside. I'm like, I do not want a problem dog. I want an easy dog because I work with problem dogs every day and I know the, and I've had one of my own and I know the heartache of that. So but I became really concerned, like the genetic pool because of spay and neuter, which we know why that happened. It had to happen for a while, but we've taken away the dog's right to even breed and to choose a mate. And that's why street dogs, in my belief, aggression isn't gonna work. You're not gonna fight every day of your life. You're gonna die because you're gonna get a wound and you're gonna get infected. Or so the aggression just naturally, it's not selected for. And I feel like the way we've raised dogs, the way we've been taught to raise dogs, and the genetic mess that we have created, because these we create border collies as pets when historically they were partners out in the sheep fields. You know, they had a most of the dogs we bred had a job, and now we tell them we tell terriers not to dig, uh, bats and hounds don't bark, German shepherds don't bite people, <laughs> but we put all that into them, and then we made their lives very very small. Um, this is, I think, all those things and uh, you know, all the above, I think. I think this is why when we look at things differently, two things that I think are, are pretty obvious or clear. One is that how we've done things hasn't worked. It's, it's not fit for purpose, really. There are, there, are, there are problems there that we have to look at. And secondly, when you do step back and look at things, there's not any part of that dog's life from breeding through that isn't kind of back to front uh, or, or needs to have a, a re-evaluation on our behalf really because um, uh, the, the general public, as I say, you know, they, they've already been um, disadvantaged by many of them just presuming the dominance model for start, uh, thinking that it's somehow if they train their dog well, everything will be fine. Uh, and then you've got all these factors you're talking about, whether it's the genes or the breeding or all these kind of things. Uh, so anything the dog tries to do to communicate need or to communicate self now becomes a battle. It's a battle all the time. 
But there's some amazing people here. We've had people in the group like Lucy Alders and Helen Moore and, and, and others uh, who have come in and shared with us about how they're doing their training uh, with, with classes and that kind of thing and how things can be looked at differently. And, and I, think, um, I think that's what this is about. And it's interesting what you said earlier about how uh, threatened even on the force free side of the community, some of these discussions are, whereas in fact, they should be really confirming because why is it that we choose to do things in a compassionate way? Why is it that we choose to do training? Even if you're really geekily, heavily opera minded, you've still chosen to do things in a kind way. That's because we want to have that connection. We want to look at that, you'd use the word participation earlier. We want somebody who participates in something. And actually focusing in on that individual dog's emotional experiences is, is the thing that ultimately will validate us for thinking that way. That is the thing that those on the more aversive side of the fence can never have. Very much so. And they're also, so two things have I've noticed over the years, a lot of these trainers um, that use force exclusively or, or they're balanced and they confuse the dog. I, I torment you and I cause you pain, but here's a cookie. So are you, are you my friend or are you my foe? And the dog is very confused and never gets relief either. But I, I feel like those who willingly and knowingly use it, not owners, because they, they're not professionals. I'm talking about professional trainers who knowingly use these tools um, when, I, when I hear about a, a horrible, another dog death at, at the hands of a trainer or a dog, I, uh, one I just did about a golden retriever in Texas died at a kennel. Whenever I look at those trainer, I, I'm, cause I'm a, a reporter and I know how to dig stuff up. And then when I was writing the midnight dog walkers, I looked up everything that had been in the news that year for dog mauling. Like dogs are mauling people a lot now, a lot, lot more than it used to happen for sure. Although there's some argument, maybe it's just covered more. But there's just horrible, I like, you know in the UK, there's been horrible children, cases of children being really, really harmed or killed. Same here, like once a week, there's a, a dog bite story that I see on my feed. Um, when I looked at the trainers and dug deep into them, if a trainer was mentioned, every single time that it was a force trainer. Not once have I found a clicker trainer or a force free trainer making national news because a dog died on their watch. I mean, that, that's pretty telling to me. Um, and the other thing is, is that if you're, if you put a shot collar on the dog, like I've had, <laughs> I had a client say to me, my dog doesn't dare get out of a downstay. And I said, well, she can't because you're going to shock her. And she knows that. What, for, what kind of trainer are you that you can, the dog will do it because you put a tool on it versus my dogs don't even have collars at this point. <laughs> um, and I can get them to do anything I want them to do or need them to do. I don't, I mean, I could go, I could be at sport if that was my interest and I felt they would love it. I could be, you know, train them to compete and win ribbons at sports because I've done that before. Um, so it, it's that, it's that shutting down of behavior that drives me crazy. And I don't, I, I really don't understand why so many people are willing to do it. I understand owners because they have a problem with their dog, but I much prefer to say, let's, like you say, let's find relief for the problem. First for the dog, the dog is expressing that it's very uncomfortable and let's look at why and let's see what we can do to, to fix the why. Instead of knock it off dog, sit down and shut up and don't bother anybody. I mean, that's, that's to me, that's cruel. That's a cruel way to live with another species. And that's why actually this is a bigger picture thing, isn't it? Because it, there's a um, societal shift that needs to happen regarding how we view behavior period. Because even with children, uh, you know, when we think about a lot of the stuff with <clears throat> child educational uh, psychology and development, how we've seen that shift there over the last few decades, uh, rather than trying to force that um, to certain child's being into some kind of conformist kind of mold, we're trying to understand the child's individual care and support needs and support them through that, which is difficult. Um, uh, Mandy Wilson came in the group talking about the learning experience and it's difficult, especially within uh, a structured educational system where the educational system has already decided what the attainment must be at the end, where, as opposed to that child's achievement just by being in that kind of format. So there's all the same kind of discussions going on there. And um, uh, we need that fundamental shift for the general dog owning 
population to start recognizing that actually those behaviors that they have been persuaded are somehow bad and need to be shifted are a communicative act on behalf of that dog uh, that needs to be listened to. And I, and I would argue maybe uh, back in the day, so when I was growing up in the 70s, we didn't do much training. We had Barbara Woodhouse on the telly over here. I don't know who you had in the state. Um, but most people had that kind of connection. If a dog growled at you, you kind of backed off. You didn't think of it being this somehow this devil dog who now needs to be rehomed or put down. And they roam the streets. And of course, there's that developed into a huge overpopulation problem. And then we get into spay and neuter, you know, trying to fix a problem. We've created a bigger problem, I think. Because um, my dog jumped the you know, six foot brick fence and he jumped the fence and followed my bus to school. And he'd be sitting there at every stop when they'd pick up. And I, I really wanted to be with the dog and not with anybody else. Um, and, and they don't, and it's dangerous. He could have been hit by a car in any day, but like the street dogs, a lot of them figured it out to how to avoid cars. Um, and it, 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 before I started writing this first, the second book, I was very pessimistic about the fate for dogs. I was, I was, it felt like the um, force trainers were the dominant, especially here, but I think there too. Like I researched um, trainer, the best trainers in Utah uh, articles recently, 18 of the 20 listed in several different articles are shock, tra shock trainers because I looked at them. So that's a pre prevalent training here in this state that I'm in. And I know that's the case for a lot of people. But when I started interviewing all these professionals, I asked all of, all of you, are you optimistic or pessimistic for the future of dogs? Everyone said optimistic. And every one of them is doing things that are helping the lives of dogs every single day and have big reach. They reach a ton of people. Um, and that sh it shifted for me. I am optimistic. And, and we're talking about all the horrible things that are going mm. on with dogs. But just the sheer fact that we're having this conversation, I don't think we could, we might've been shot if we had had it five years ago. You know, they, they'll, they'll come for you. They will come for you. And they have, they've come for both of us on occasion. Well, yeah, because I know when I, when I uh, put out my Phantom of the Opera piece a few years ago now, um and uh you know i had uh, i had good support for i put it out you know people like linda michaels very kindly offered a lot of support there because um her um hierarchy of dog needs was it was a really important part of that really and um denise of course uh and, and others um but it was uh it was well received but there was a certain element that really were quite vehemently opposed to it <laughs> uh, and anything that was said in it. And, uh, and just like with your piece, you know, for me, it was a piece about empathy and compassion. It wasn't, it wasn't saying don't train. It wasn't about anything else. And I know the title was a little bit kind of um, designed to get people in, but, uh, but I think, so what's, what's the thing for you then now then that makes you positive then? What, what is it that makes you think, yeah, there's, I can feel optimistic about things more generally. It was talking to, professionals all over the world and hearing what they're doing and the changes and the way they train and um, the protocols that many have begun to use. And again, it was the general kindness of these professionals. And I, I think that it's very easy as a dog trainer to, if you're only online, to feel pessimistic because there's so much infighting, especially among ourselves. <laughs> Um, but if it's not us, then we're, we're arguing with a client, please don't throw your dog on the ground because you saw somebody on TV do that, that kind of thing. So there's just a whole lot that, that you have to go through to get even to in front of the dog, a lot of emotional um, issues to overcome and arguments to overcome. So um, when I was talking to these professionals, it seems like Dr. Mar Marty Becker, America's vet veterinarian, I interviewed him and Mikhail Becker, he started Fear Free Veterinary and Cooperative Care and veterinary, that needed to happen so badly. It's like now we, we all talk about cooperative care and general, general handling in the vet, veterinary setting. Nobody was saying that. And I hated to go to the vet, even though I've worked with excellent veterinarians because it stressed my very sensitive hurt, hurting dogs so much. He has, I mean, he's gotten so many veterinarians certified through that. And that's an educational tool. And, and I'm certified through it as a trainer. And it may not, like I had a, a fear-free visit with a vet here. She's a mobile vet. I didn't know she was here. And I was elated because my dogs don't like enjoy car travel. She walked in with a can of spray cheese and sat on the floor because Finn, the, the red one, he'll, he'll bite. I have no, comp I have every confidence. If he push him too hard, he doesn't like what you're doing. He he's, probably wouldn't bite us, but he might. So I was a little worried about how that would be handled. Easy. He loved her. 
it took all our trees. It just made a world of difference. And that's what has changed for me is that there are people like you and Kim Brophy and Laura Donaldson who are um, willing to take the, the arrows and, and the hate mails and um, set about changing the world. Like, I don't think you woke up and said, I think I'm gonna talk about beyond the operant and um, it's gonna change the entire industry. You know, you're probably like, well, maybe two or three people are here and maybe I'll affect some dogs. I didn't write Midnight Dog Walkers thinking I'm gonna change people's lives. I hoped I changed dogs' lives <laughs> for the better. And here we are, you know, a year later and the stuff that you started talking about, was it a year ago or two years ago beyond the operant? The whole industry is going, what? What does this mean? We need to look at this. I mean, some are fighting it, of course, and they will, and that's up to them. But it's had a dramatic, and what Kim Brophy's doing with her legs program, which I'm certified family dog mediator through her because it was, it was such an impressive. Her course, I kind of felt like watching, especially when you guys, you two would talk, um, like this is what I felt all along. And you guys are putting words to it and making sense out of it and making it accessible for people. Her course was the only training course that I recall in 20 years that I didn't want to end. You know, usually it's like, do I have to take the test now? Let's get through this. <laughs> No, I agree. I, I did it when it first came out and it was, uh, it was, uh, it interferes with your social life, right? doesn't it? Not that I have much of one, but uh, because it's like a good book, you can't put that course down. When you, when you start it, you have to keep just looking at things in it. And I think this is the big shift, I think. Um, and technology's helped because this isn't about anything new. I think, uh, you know, I had my views on some things and I just put a few things out and, and that's how I connected with Kim actually when I put out Phantom of the Opera, that's how we connected. So I think you just end up with these branches of a tree really, just everybody thinking, well, okay, there's similar narratives here. And having the chance to, because of, um, because of uh, technology now to get voices together with the dog center care group, that was the whole point of it really, it was just to kind of have a safe space. So lots of different people could have one place to, talk about their work and share their courses and, and then people can just find that kind of space really. But the big thing for me is this shift away from um, this notion of uh, looking at tools and methods as being the main place that we argue over. Right. Um, because this is actually just recognizing, well, if we are looking purely at task-led quite arbitrary approach to I'm going to make this dog do or not do something then the arguments will continue the balanced aversives will have their arguments the positives will have their arguments when you start thinking about working out that truth of that individual dog and what their care and support needs are and removing those judgments and labels from that behavior then a lot of those arguments become mute then because uh you know uh I think any when we think about things in terms of relief, like we were talking about earlier, which is a word I use a lot because I think it's fundamental that we start thinking about what is that dog, what relief could they be seeking? Just shutting down a behavior, especially in a kind of aversive way, um, is just saying to that dog, I don't care how you think and feel right now, I just need you to stop it. And this brings us back to those power dynamics we were talking about earlier, how women have been treated more widely, how children have been treated more widely, this notion that somehow your voice isn't important now, you have to conform to this. Then we'll talk. And this is the thing that when we think about balance training to, to a point, I think, um, uh, is this notion of just being stuck in tasks. So it's not about people being bad. Even professionals, I feel, it's not necessarily about them being bad. I think it's just they're stuck in tasks, the task of, I need you to stop this and this is how I can do it. And we're gonna do it this way. When we start thinking more in terms of care, everything shifts. And that's about being available to that emotional truth of the dog, of the caregiver. There's, there's, there's multiple nervous systems at play in any case, isn't there really? Uh, and it's not even about not using uh, training, as I say, yeah, I, I, it, this, the training bit isn't the issue. I think making it that the training is the most important thing without thinking about what behaviors we're creating in regards to that individual dog and whether they have any internal value to that animal. Uh, and also being truthful about if we're doing things because we enjoy it, then that's okay as well, right? Because the stuff that I do, I'm sure my dogs, don't enjoy as much as I do, but that's okay. It's just being honest about some of these things. And this is the big change, I think, in these kind of discussions is just thinking about what the more looks like. Because there's a, there's a lot more to think about. Yeah, like another reason you asked why I'm optimistic when I have historically been quite pessimistic about 
well, because of my work in rescue um, and seeing what people were willing to do to dogs, it's also because of owners, because owners are getting more educated. And I've had so many come to me and say, I don't want to hurt my dog. I, I went to a class and the trainer, you know, yanked the dog and put up a scary looking collar on it. And I do not want that for my dog. And we're, that's what I think we've been trying to do all these years is empower the dog owner to be the advocate and say, I don't want to train that way and then come find us. And I even put in my book, and I put it in both books. I put my email in there and said at the end, if you made it this far and you cannot find a positive, a truly positive reinforcement, not somebody that just has that on their website and they got the shot collar they sell from the back room. If you're having trouble because there weren't, there aren't enough of us, especially aren't enough veterinary behaviorists. I think there's 80 or 90 in the entire world. Um, a lot of rural communities don't either have no trainer or it's a master trainer and from the military, which a military dog is completely different from a pet dog, but never mind. Um, so I put my email in there, said, write me, I will do a search for you. And then the pet professional, this was before the PPG was around, then they came along and made it a lot easier for me. So I just asked for their zip code and I will go find the, because I know a lot of the trainers. I don't know everybody, but I know a whole lot of them. And I'll find the one that I personally think if I do know them. But even if I don't know any of the trainers in the city, I'm confident in the pet professional guild that they've been vetted and they are not pretending that they they're, for, they're completely force-free. They actually are force-free and committed to it and have the ethics. They sign their ethical trainers to me. So that makes, that makes it a lot easier for me and for owners to search through that through the pet professional guild or some other approved and legit organizations once you find them, like the UK charter over there. Um, but I get people write me every week and ask for a trainer. And that the book's seven or eight years old. And it's that hard to find it. And there's just so much marketing gobbledygook. You know, it's actually atrocious when you start reading some, you know, I've had dogs for 30 years and, and that makes you a trainer. I mean, I've had teeth my whole life. I'm not a dentist. No, it's true. And, and we have a big thing over here. I don't know it's like there, but, um, you know, a lot of the professionals say dog walkers. Uh, they really they love working with dogs and they think, oh, I think I'll become a dog trainer. And, and then they become a dog overnight. Uh, but but I think um, uh, when we start thinking about the dog in a more holistic way, and we understand more now about the connections between physiology and uh, cognitive aspects and development periods, all these kind of things affect that behavioral output. Just the arbitrary changing of that behavior to either do something instead or to not do something. That's the big shift we're moving away from. And I, and I think even asking, I'm sure you find it, and you'll, it'd be interesting to see the kind of questions you get asked off the new book with the general public when they read it and they email you and say, Annie, I need somebody who can do. Uh, and um, uh, I think people value a lot finding professionals who aren't just going to tell them how to get their dog to do stuff, but are going to support them to understand what it is their dog's asking of them in the first place, I think. So when we think about this book, then let's just, let's just, because we're coming to the end now, it's flown by, of course, uh, and it would do, but um, what, I, what was really interesting was you'd, you'd pretty well written the book, uh, and then you heard some of the Beyond the Opera conversations, you came along to Dog Centre Care, I know, and, uh, and looked at a lot of the, the conversations that I'd had in the group, and you pretty well started over with that book. Uh, you kind of had changed the kind of outlook for it. So what is it we can expect to see? We're going to, you're going to be coming back in the autumn, which will be great, or the fall for our American friends, uh, to when the book's uh, hopefully with us by then. Um, but give us a little glimpse into what it is, what are the fundamental shifts you've done, and what is that kind of ethos surrounding this book now? What can we expect? That's a great question. I, um, I wanted to ask why, you know, that's, I'm a nosy person, I'm a curious person, I want to know why are dogs so troubled? And I began with, to me, it's a fact that they're troubled. <laughs> um, you can still find a good dog out there, but it's, it's becoming increasingly hard to find a, a well-balanced, resilient, normal dog. So I wanted to know um, why. why, why are they so troubled? So I, I researched that and had my own opinions of that, the, the breeding, the puppy mills, the now COVID dogs, uh, human expectations is a huge part of it not researching the breed and understanding what your particular breed was for and even why you want that particular dog. Like I had from Kim's course, Kim Brophy's course, I had to look at why I like herding dogs because she calls them codependent. <laughs> and I'm like, so I'm not codependent with humans anymore. I fixed that. 
but now I, I've always had very, very Velcro herding dogs. And so I've decided my next dog is going to be like a terrier or, or, or a bull yeah. and get out of this. You know, that's me. That's me choosing to, why, why do you want that particular breed? I think it's important. So I looked at why and how dogs have become so troubled. And then I asked what's new, like, like I said, what's new in behavior, particularly for reactivity. Um, beyond that, and I'll I want to talk about what that chapter, because it's chapter three, and, and who's in there, and why I included stuff, and why I left stuff out, because if you are stuck struggling with reactivity, which most people are, that's usually the number one complaint, barking, lunging, screaming at triggers, um, that chapter is, I, it took me a month to write just that one chapter, because it, it, it's, it, it's so innovative of what these trainers are doing. The, uh, the rest of the book and each chapter has a one or two, mostly two or sometimes three interviews with experts. Um, you know, I kind of fit them in where I felt they're like we have a puppy trainer, Christine Young. She's in the, the puppy and Denise O'Moore's in the adolescent part of that chapter, et cetera. And you're in the bonding chapter. <laughs> so I thought that worked out how to bond with your dog and increase the bond. But beyond reactivity, which I'm going to get back to that chapter because I think it's crucial. I think it's the heart of the book. And so, well, I don't know. I like it a lot. I have a whole chapter on behavior euthanasia which I had in uh, Midnight Dog Walkers because 20,000 people are now in a very painful but very supportive group losing Lulu about you can't get in unless you've personally experienced this after you've had to make that horrible decision. 20,000 people are just gutted. I mean, the, it's hard to read sometimes because people blame themselves. And anyway, so I have a whole thing and with solutions and there's bereavement counselors now. And I think counselors are taking pet grief much more seriously. Um, I have canine enrichment. I have all the other behaviors that dogs do that frustrate owners, excessive digging, barking, pulling on a leash. Like that, that wasn't included in the Midnight Dog Walkers. It was mostly reactivity because that's what I was seeing the most. Um, I have a chapter on the trifecta of the, uh, the most important people in a dog's life, which is obviously the owner and the veterinarian and the trainer. And I asked from the perspective of each one, what does a veterinarian need from an owner? What does an owner need from a trainer? And I don't think we trainers ask, ask them, much, what, what do you need from us? And I did, I went on large groups and asked owners, what do you want from trainers? And got very interesting answers, what they need from us as a group. And my last chapter, there are two chapters that will, I think cause, if it, if it causes anything, uh, the knives to come out for me, which fine, I'm used to it. Um, and one is chapter three. So the last chapter is called, who can you trust? because I'm always writing for owners and it's hard to know who to trust with your dog and uh, horrible, horrible things can happen if the owner is out of sight. And I've seen it myself in kennels. Um, so I did not include any organization. I mostly was so saying organizations that certify trainers, basically. So it's not individual trainers. It's more like groups. So every now and then it might be an individual if they have a big program, like Leslie McDevitt with Control Unleash, but she's certifying people under her program. So it's that kind of thing. What's, what's truly positive reinforcement. And I left out any, anyone who um, I know subscribes to Lima, least, least intrusive, mentally aversive. And I left them out and that left out some very large organizations, but I left it out because that has opened the door to shock trainers joining those organizations. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's based on science that's outdated, frankly. Like they, they are not taking in the consideration of the last 20 years they don't look at Jack Pansop and the seven emotional, seven emotions that all mammals feel. They don't talk about the bond. And if they're just not in my book, I tried very hard to weed them out. And I was thrilled that there's so many, there's quite a few. Um, I mean, we, we know all of, all of them if you're in the industry, but, um, and they're growing, there's ever more. So I think that chapter, and also we, I list the name, the words to run from. I have a whole list. If the, if the website says this, run. And go find, e email me. I will find you the right trainer. Uh, That's bathroom. really important because um, the, the shop front can look quite leery. But when you actually look at what's on the shelves, it can be very different. And that is certain words and certain terms. It's the general public wouldn't necessarily know how to spot. So that would be a really helpful uh, addition, I think, for the general public. Yeah. And that was just a decision I made. And if people don't like it, they can write their own book and make their own recommendations, you know. Um, cause I, I really want force fee free. I want that to be, and I want to teach owners how to weave through all the marketing. So chapter three is the big one on reactivity. It's a very long chapter. And I originally had, I was going to interview three of the 
professionals that were really kind of focusing on reactivity because like I have a veterinary behaviorist in there. She also focuses, focuses on reactivity, but she's also a veterinarian. Um, you know, puppy experts, like I said, canine enrichment experts. Um, but I chose these three people and I had, so I was gonna do their programs, kind of outline and in interviews with them. And then I was gonna do counter conditioning and desensitizing and management under that. So they, we have three kind of new ideas, newish, and then the old ones. And they, I got so involved in learning their programs that counter conditioning kept sinking lower and lower and lower, and it didn't have a place anymore. And I'm not saying don't ever use it, but like you said, it was it, it was the big thing and it excluded and left out everything else. And it just made me feel like, I don't wanna revisit that. I have two chapters on it in the Midnight Dog Walkers. So I wrote that, if you wanna know about this, go get Midnight Dog Walkers, which is out of print, but you can get it on Kindle. So the three people that I put in there, and I said, generally I would start in this order, but it depends on the dog and the person and what the dog is doing. Sarah Fisher is first with ACE and free work because that's looking at the body and eliminating any possible pain, because we know that pain is 80%, can be 80% involved with reactivity. So you have to rule out pain as well as go to your veterinarian. And she does tremendous work. She's letting a dog be a dog and asking why. And so I, always start, I started with her and explained her program. And she's a delightful human being. She's a very kind person. And then was um, Dr. Laurel Donaldson, slow thinking movement is saving dogs lives. And she is coming from the brain point of view and cognitive reappraisal that we can, we always, we worked on the body, behave, what we can observe in a dog for years, ignored the brain seemingly. And she has proven and science has proven that we can teach a dog to take a step back and cognitively think about what is happening instead of just exploding. So we got Sarah Fisher on the body for lack of a better term, Laura on the brain and then Kim Brophy on the legs because her program, Applied Ethology, takes in, to me, all of the sciences and not just cherry picking learning theory. And then I did leave management in because I think management is an underused tool. And I, and I have interviews with them too. I have two interviews with Kim in the book and um, it, it just blew my brain. And I have sent it to a few trainers to get their input and I wrote it for owners, but the trainers got very excited about it. Because when you see it all together and you see those interviews as you're reading to me, it just compounds the um, knowledge. It's shared knowledge. And they all kind of said in some ways the same thing, which is what we're saying, which is consider the whole dog and not just one thing because you like that science and let the dog be a dog and ask why. And why is this behavior happening and how can I reduce the frustration? And it's, I, I am so glad I included the experts because otherwise it's just me, you know? Mm -hmm. I get sick of myself. I've been on a lot of interviews and I'm already sick of myself. And it, it just added so much. And I don't know of another dog training book that has that many interviews in it. And um, it just kind of adds to this, I can't say Bible, because I'll get in trouble, dog training Bible um, for owners that if you don't have a trainer or you can't afford a trainer, uh, start with this book, even a very, very serious. I have um, Melina Demartini for separation anxiety and noise phobia. Um, you know, it's a how to begin going down the path of working this out yourself because there's not enough trainers or they're only forceful trainers in your area. And that's my goal with it. I think it's going to tick all those boxes and more. And I think even for the general professional community as well, it's going to be um, a, a, a chance for them to safely have a look at these other viewpoints because I think it's really important that we, that we look at that and um, uh, uh, and uh, to have it all in one place I think that's going to be the really special thing here and I think it's a real testament to you as well uh, Annie that you because it's hard to open up to, the, to a collaborative process you know it's it's um, you know true collaboration and, and that's what you've done with this book I think it was a really inspired idea really to, to get to kind of get input and to for you to become the storyteller, if you like, as you weave the story of this way of looking at things with dogs. Well, and it's been amazing. So um, uh, where can people find out more about you know, what's going on for you? I'm guessing the Midnight Dog Walkers group is a really good one to, to be a part of. That's a private, free Facebook group, um, heavily 
I wouldn't say heavily. My husband says aggressive. He's a techie, aggressively moderated. In turn, actually, I don't even really have to moderate because the group behaves. <laughs> it's a more aggressive. I'm more aggressive about who I let in. I'm very careful about who I let in. Not because we're special, and we're snobs. It's because I don't want trolls. I am troll aversive. I'm troll reactive. Mm -hmm. I have short fuse about people coming in, especially dog trainers, and playing little games and their, their little things that they do. Like it's not bad if it's not aversive. If you just don't know how to use it and all the fruit in the fruit bowl. And I'm like, no, this is go elsewhere. There's plenty of places to have that kind of chat. It, it's not about tools, as you say. It's not about learning theory. It's it's about bonding with the dog and how we make the dog's lives better. We're asking ourselves, how can we make this dog's life better? How can we help this dog? that had a horrible beginning or that was abused or that neglected or, you know, all of, all of that. And it's an interesting group because it's trainers from all over the world and owners. And um, I feel like people share information. I've tried to make it like you, Dog Centered Cares, it feels like a safe place because it's not always safe. Very, very often it's not safe online because of the keyboard mm. work. Um, and you've created that. And I think it's been very healing for many people and your workshops, which I did love. And um, I think I want the Midnight Dog Walkers to be a healing place because a lot of, so many people have had behavior euthanasia cases of their own or they counsel people through it, um, or they just have a dog that they're rearranging their entire life over because the dog is so troubled. I mean, that we see that a lot. Um, so I, I feel like it's free flowing information. People are welcome to apply, not apply. I ask you three questions. If you don't abide by the rules and I don't want lurkers, I mean, I don't want forced lur lurkers. Because I'm going to look at the profile, <laughs> every single person. It's a very small group. It's like 2,000 members. It's probably one of the smaller dog training groups, but it's very peaceful. And I keep it small on purpose. Like I'm not going to ever make it public because any, anybody can chime in and anybody can join. Um, and I, I just work really hard to keep it friendly and, and force free to each other as humans. Well, I think that's important because we were talking off air about how there is a very small minority in this that we've got to remember it is a small number who are creating more of a um, more of a toxicity in their elements uh, and makes it very difficult for people to feel safe so i think i think a lot of people will applaud you for doing that in the group and of course we're a big fan in dogs to care of anything kind of uh, any so uh, we'll make sure the stuff gets shared in there as well so thank you so much for us um especially because it's an early start for you there today uh thank you so much for giving your time today Annie, and we really look forward to the book we'll keep sharing teasers for that in the group uh and you're coming back again in the autumn i think i'm coming over your to your side as well in the autumn as well gonna, the chat. so me and Denise so, on Saturday chats so lots of Andy and, and Annie well, that sounds quite <laughs> cool doesn't it uh, sounds like some kind of 70s folk band um brilliant well thank you Annie thank you so much and thank you everybody for listening in today um just a quickie uh Robert Faulkner Taylor's monthly chats uh we had a bit of a a technology mayor last week, so we had to postpone, but it's this week, uh, the 13th, uh, Robert's talking to Claire Martin, please come along if you can for that. And then the uh, following week, 19th, we've got the amazing Daniela Beck talking all things meerkat, so so that's uh, that's coming up. Uh, we, we talked about my workshop, um, I've got a new date, it's in the group if you're interested, on the 14th of August is going to be the next one, they, they tend to sell out pretty quick, so if you want to kind of deep dive on some of the stuff you've been, uh, Annie, uh, we kind of look at the philosophy and the psychology behind a lot of this new way of thinking, and it complements a lot, I think. If people have done legs, for example, or Sarah's or Laura's work, I think it complements those uh, workshops really well. Um, brilliant. Well, thank you, Annie. Any last words before we go? Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me here. I always look forward to our conversations, and I always learn something every time. And I also want to thank you for t having the courage to begin, the you began the conversation. I just picked up the baton and put it in a book um, in, in large part, but you had the courage to do that, knowing that the tr they were gonna come for you <laughs> because you're, you're, you're a, paradigm, a paradigm shifter, an industry disruptor. I mean, that's not why you set out to do it. You came from how, what you saw and observed in dogs and because you made the choice to do beyond the operant, that changed my life and it changed any dog that I interact with after, after I listened to all of that and after I, researched and learned what I learned for the book. And also every, all, of, all of these trainers have had a profound influence on me because I, again, because of their kindness. Like I think they're, 
they don't block as people as fast as I do. They have a higher to to tolerance. They and they will try to convince somebody to not use harmful tools. Where I'm like done. Um, but I've changed my stance on several things, including people who use electric collars. Owners, I would be. I'm not your trainer. Go away. Which is extremely judgmental, and I can see that now. I mean, I, I kind of I wanted to shame them because I thought you're a terrible person, <laughs> and now I see it as a lack of education, and they have a problem with the dog. And if I don't fix it or help them in a force-free way or can try to work with them, they're going to go to the guy down the street who's going to put the shot collar on it. So I, I shut out a lot of owners and I publicly apologize for that, but I wouldn't have gotten there if I hadn't talked to these experts because that's how they handle it. And it's been, it's a, it's a shift. It's been an emotional shift for me and really changed my life. I mean, that's phenomenal. And Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> well, thank you for those kind words. But I think the one thing to bear in mind is we're all, we all we all filter influences around us and we, we put that through our own filter and then we, we cast our light out for those who want to feel it. Uh, and that's the process, isn't it? I've got all my influences. You know, Sarah's a big one for me. And uh, and um, so, and you've done the same now. I and mean, this is what's so beautiful because we all share our thoughts and people hear what is important to them and take the strands that are important to them, put them through their own filter and they create their own light. And that this book is definitely a, a product of your passion and your uh, openness, I think, to that process. So th this is why these collaborative spaces, especially dogs and to care are so important really, because because we, we without those connections, we, we can't fully understand the whole. Because even understanding, you know, the only kind of emotional experience we can really validate is our own. Right. trying to be available to that emotional truth of another is really hard especially in other species and it's going to take many many voices to try and even scratch the surface i think well thanks honey thank you so much it's been great seeing you uh thanks everybody in the group and i uh, hope you can join robert on the 13th with his chat with claire thanks honey speak to you soon thanks